Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Hello, and welcome to Painting of the Week. This week, I am out and about without Laura, and I'm at the Ashmolean in Oxford. And I'm with Claire Pollard, who's the curator of Japanese art. And we've chosen uh, an artwork which is part of an exhibition which is currently on. And this is in November 2021. So it may not be on when you finally get to hear this podcast or if you're listening to this podcast sometime in the distant future. Um, But the image will always be on our website. Uh, If you are listening to this before January the 3rd, 2022, then I absolutely urge you to get down to Oxford, get to the Ashmolean and see the exhibition called The Art of Tokyo, because it's, because it's fantastic. This particular artwork is by an artist called Utagawa Kunimasa, the fourth, and I'm going to try and pronounce the name of the painting, which looks like Rion Kaku Tower Game, 1890. And it's a choice that Claire has made. So my first question to Claire is, why? Why choose it for the exhibition? Or why Why choose it as my um, subject of this talk? The the, the latter. The latter, okay. I chose it because it's one of my favourite objects in the entire exhibition. Um, It's a really unusual and striking example of of an ukiyo-e, one of the commercial woodblock prints that were produced in their thousands from the 18th century onwards. This, um, as you say, the, the it's called, the date was 1890, so it wasn't made until the late 19th century, so it's a really late example. But what I love about it is that there's so much going on behind the scenes, um, both literally um, in the fact that it was a board game with flaps that open up as you roll the dice and move your way up this tall tower, but also um, in that it reveals so much about the time when the print was made, when Japan was going through a really momentous um, period in its history, it was transforming itself from a, a, a pre industrial feudal nation to a kind of a leading um, nation in the world so this talks to all of that so there's so many things we can talk about which is great could you start by maybe obviously hopefully people are looking at the image on the website the seventh art productions website but could you just describe for those who are just maybe walking and can't actually see it what are we actually looking at? What does it look like, okay. broadly speaking? So this is um, a depiction of a tower. This is Japan's first ever modern skyscraper. It's a 12-story um, red brick octagonal building, um, and it's carefully depicted over two sheets of paper, vertically arranged one above the other, really to emphasise the great height of this building. Um, uh, yes, so the, the, it's very uh, colourful, the upper part of the building is set against a very striking, intense red colour. And if you go down towards the base of the building, you see tiny little figures in colourful clothes, purple, yellow and green, queuing up to enter this building. This was a a building that was designed um, as a a tourist attraction and um, it was opened in November, uh, so it's kind of appropriate, this is exactly where we are now, 1890. um, And it was a sort of a a huge um, visitor attraction. Now, I know from, from your fabulous catalogue that in 1943, was it? But Tokyo suffered the worst damage of any city as far as conventional bombing is concerned. Did this building survive? Does this building survive? Is it still extant? It doesn't. And in fact, it had been demolished Uh, 20 years earlier than that. Uh, This building, which was um, built as a a kind of a a beacon of modernity in the late 19th century, when Japan was really modernising itself, this skyscraper was a a symbol of of modern Japan. Um, But it didn't live for very long, as it were. In 1923, the great Kanto earthquake devastated the city. Um, Huge areas of of Tokyo were destroyed. And this 12-storey building was... Um, destroyed above the eighth floor and it had to be completely demolished. Um, so sadly, it didn't even make it to the war. Oh, uh, I see. Now, obviously, the, the, the podcast is called The Painting of the Week. Yes. But what would you... What is this exactly? This is a, a woodblock print. Um, 
which was um, made by a publisher um, who commissioned the artist Utagawa Kunimasa IV, um, who was really the designer of the print. So he commissioned um, the artist to create a design that would then have been sent to woodblock carvers to carve the design and then sent on to printers to print it up to create this, um, this object. And it was very much a commercial print. I mean, it looks very striking. The colors are really bright. It's very um, interesting composition. It's, it's, it's quite an appealing object, I feel. Um, but it was made as a, a a, a commercial object. What happened in 1890, this tower was opened um, and it was promoted as a, kind of a, a, a visit attraction. And within the first month of it opening, I think over 50,000 people came to, to see this, this new building. And publishers were really keen to um, kind of cater to the demand of, the, of, of people to have souvenirs, to, um, for people who couldn't go, to actually see images of this exciting new building. Um, and so they produced umpteen versions of um, postcards and prints of the tower. So this is just one of many different versions by different artists. So this version, which is interactive, yes. should we imagine that it was hung and the interactivity happened, people were throwing a dice on a table in front of it, or would it have been laid flat on a table and people are throwing dice around it like, a, like we imagine a board game? Yes, more like that. I mean, prints tended not to be hung anyway in ah, Japan. Okay. People acquired prints and they often um, would put them into albums or put them in a drawer. Um, a Japanese house doesn't have pictures on the walls in the same way as a, as yeah. a, a European house. You would have a, a tokonoma, a display alcove where you might show one painting which you then rotated depending on the season or the mood you wanted to create, but prints tended not to be treated like that. But this one, no, it would have been played flat. It actually comes folded up in, inside a, a little sleeve, which we still have, remarkably. I mean, this was a game that was designed to be played, and you would expect it to be in tatters, so we're really yeah. you know, thrilled that it still survives. And we have still its, its beautiful little, little um, case, which is about half the size of one of the sheets of paper. So it would have been folded up inside, and the outside of the, um, of the sleeve shows the top half of the, of the tower with the electric lights that beamed out of it. It was, it was known because it had electric lights on every floor, um, which illuminated the whole um, district of Asakusa, which is where it was built. Um, so yes, you would, it would have been very exciting. It would have been quite cheap to buy, and you would have taken it out of this little sleeve and unfolded it, um, and then played with the dice. Um, and what, what's quite fun about it is that the instructions for play are on, written onto, or printed onto the onto the, the picture itself. So um, each of the each of the floors is labelled with a number, and there are extra instructions. So you start at the bottom of the tower, where the entrance is. So that's the beginning. And, and um, like snakes and ladders, um, progress isn't entirely straightforward. Mm -hmm. So it, this is the entrance, and you, you throw your dice and you work your way um, up the building. But it says that um, if you throw, I think it's if you if you throw a one at the entrance, you go straight up to the eighth floor. Wow! But even if you get to the eighth floor, you know, it's not plain sailing because on the eighth floor, if you throw a six, you go back to the beginning okay. again. And um, this is a dice, six-sided dice. Uh, I think it's the same sort, so sort of So one, two, three, four, five, yes, six. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you have you have another little um, instruction that I really like on the tenth floor, which is where you have the kind of the, the, the rest rest area and, and the cafe, as it were. Um, it says here, please stop and um, have a rest and a bite to eat, which basically is miss a go, isn't it? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I mean, I I know a little bit about board games because my my brother was three times the British Monopoly champion. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so board games have played a big role in our in our life fantastic. growing up. But 1890, I mean, I don't know how far back the history of board games go, but to imagine a family with their dice or die, you know, around, a, around an artwork like this, or, well, that's the question. Would he have thought of this as a game or as an artwork? Um, I think more as a game. Um, as I say, it was, it was a commercial, commercial enterprise, enterprise, the, the, okay. the UQA um, industry. But um, in terms of board games, there's a really long history of board games in Japan. It's called Sugoroku in Japanese. In fact, that's part of the title. It's, this is Ryo Unkaku, which is the name of the, of the tower, which literally means the pavilion that soars above the clouds. So it's a very appropriate title. So it says Ryo Unkaku Sugoroku, and Sugoroku is the name of, of board games. And they were actually popular in Japan from as early as the 13th century, when they were mainly used as Buddhist teaching tools. Um, and then by the 17th century, they, they covered a lot more different subjects. So you might have them on the theme of flower arranging or or um, I don't know, the Kabuki theatre, and there were some erotic ones mm. even. Um, it was kind of an excuse to kind of to, to, to make a, a fun design. And by the late 19th century, they're often used in a very um, 
uh, didactic or kind of propagandist way to promote the kind of the, the program of modernization that the government was was kind of imposing at the time to show people how to engage with new Western customs or how you know promoting really beautiful new um, beacons of progress like this one. Mm. Sort of pick up on one thing, which is yeah. the idea that Japanese didn't really hang art yes. on their walls yes. in the same way as we imagine the Dutch did in the Dutch yeah. Golden Age, or plenty of other examples. Is that anything to do with the architecture of their buildings, or I mean, why why would that be? Why why do you think they didn't quite so much? Because obviously, aesthetic beauty is key part. As, you know, when we look back on, in Japanese history. So why wouldn't you hang something like this up? Prints weren't weren't really considered fine art in in the way we think about art. They were they were um, the whole genre well, had Buddhist woodblock printing for, for, for centuries, but the, the commercial secular woodblock printing um, developed um, to kind of give quick, cheap images of um, popular entertainments, popular people, sort of heroes of popular culture, um, really from kind of the, the 18th century onwards. And they were they were not thought of as sort of great art. Um, they were mm. considered like posters or postcards or, or something. I mean, you get, for example, pictures of actors, kabuki actors, who were the, who were the stars of the film stars, the kind of the football stars of, the, of, of their day. And people just wanted images of their, of their heroes that they would very often put inside albums and sort of... Of, of okay. um, you used to get the same thing with courtesans, who were leaders of fashion and, and, and um, the, the glamorous the symbols of stars of their age. So um, it, it wasn't the same thing. You did, ha you did have, of course, you had beautiful art being displayed in houses. You had, um, as I said, the display alcove with beautiful scrolls. You'd have um, in larger houses. You'd have folding screens. Castles and, and sort of samurai mansions would have um, folding screens being depicted. But um, I think. The, the idea that you would have a specific space where you would create a mood that you could change was something. And you, in Japan, you have a, a sense of the seasons of, of, of um, the occasion. You don't want something that's on your wall the whole time. Mm. Um, you would create a particular mood with a particular art form. Okay. Mm. Do you think there's anything different, and maybe this is something that emerges from the exhibition more broadly than this particular artwork, about the Japanese and their attitude towards art and beauty. I remember seeing in your, I think it was the summary of the exhibition rather than the catalogue, where there's a reference to the fact that because the Japanese had been isolated and hadn't been involved in international wars, and that actually there was more time, more energy spent on art and pleasure. Do I remember that correctly? I think during a period of peace, you know, there is, there tends to be, it's easier to create art, isn't it? You're, yeah. There's more, you know, as, yes, more time and more money available to enjoy yourself rather than survive. But when you were putting together the exhibition, is there a huge kind of, tre not treasure trove, but just a huge resource of Japanese art? I mean, the, the question really is, is there anything different about the Japanese and their attitude towards art than, say, the Europeans of the 19th century? I think there are lots of differences. I mean, for a start, the word art didn't exist in, in Japan until the late 19th century. That was, it was a translation of European term. And art and all the, sort of the variations, fine art and decorative art and all the, sort of the hierarchy of, of art, that, that didn't exist in Japan and, until later. You just had your different kinds of art. You had your painting and your, um, your, your um, lacquer work and your ceramics. It, 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 sort of, it wasn't quite a hierarchy like that. Mm. Um, in terms of... Question. In terms of what we found, what, what we were trying to show in, in the exhibition, um, and, and what the themes that came through, yes, I think different kinds of art serve different purposes, don't they? I mean, whatever, whatever culture. Mm. We focused in, in, in part on um, the art of you know, the art that captures entertainment. The, 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 historically, the floating world, the pleasure quarters, the mm. drama and the, the, um, the, the, the brothel district, um, the, sort of the, the fleeting pleasures that you have there. Um, but we also point out the kind of the, the element of melancholy, the kind of the negative side of things that always in, that often informs Japanese art. I mean, the, one of the, the themes of the exhibition is, is Tokyo and Japan in general is constantly having to think about 
destruction and, and, and renewal of the fact that it's the nature is very can be very extreme mm-hmm. in Japan. You have earthquakes, you have typhoons, you have fires, you have floods, you have you know life is quite um, fleeting, and yeah. this is obviously a, a key teaching in Buddhism too. The fact that life is, is sort of very impermanent, you yeah. have to kind of grab on to grab on to life while it's there, yeah. um, and that's something that I think you see throughout the, 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 the different centuries of, of art. I mean, I've been to Japan two or three times now, and I'm always struck by the aesthetic detail in the most unlikely. It might be somebody's little garden. Yeah. It might have a, it might be three foot between the front door and the pavement, but it's so beautifully cared for, and it might have a little design with stones, and there's some beautifully kind of in a way that you don't see so much in, in British towns, you know. It, it feels... I think front gardens are beautiful. Some, I think some are, but it's... you're looking for that in Japan. You're looking for what you want to see, I do yes. think. I mean, it's like, um, you know, when you come across a temple in the middle of the busy, busy streets of Tokyo, it kind of makes a huge impact. Whereas, actually, for somebody coming to London, you would come across a, you know, a beautiful cemetery and, and it would have it's the same true. effect. That's <laughs> true. That's true. Back to this artwork, yes. then. So one of the first things that strikes me, of course, is the is the importance of the colour red. Yes. Presumably no accident. Um, well, I mean, what can we read from beyond the flags? But I mean, the, the red sky. Do you think there's is 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 that suggestive of something just beyond the fact that it's striking? Absolutely. So. Um for centuries, from, from, the, from the 12th century onwards, Japan had been ruled by elite warriors. Um, in the mid-19th century, um, the um, European powers, America and, and the European powers, forced Japan to open up to trade. They, were, they forced Japan to sign a whole raft of um, diplomatic and trade treaties. Um, 1868, is that the big year? That's, that's, the, that's what happened. Well, it was the 1850s that, that, that the, okay. all these aggressive foreign powers made Japan kind of deal with them. Um, and this really exacerbated a, a kind of internal unrest and led to the overthrow of the samurai government and the um, founding of a new government. That's the 1868 date. There was a, a, a new government that was established ruling in the name of the emperor. Um, and the new government was determined that Japan wouldn't fall victim to the expansionist um, Western powers. And so it committed the country to a, a, a really dramatic program of modernization and industrialization, so called westernization. Um, so every, every aspect of, of life really was transformed. You had government itself, but you also had education and transport and um, fashion and architecture. Um, and this was called, this whole program of, of sort of modernization was called Bunmei Kaika, which means civilization and enlightenment. Um, this this beautiful diptych of the Ryo Unkaku Tower is an example of a print called a Bunmei Kaika E, so a civilization and enlightenment print. So this is a, a genre print that specifically featured aspects of this modernization of the city. Um, so steam trains and sewing machines and um, some European fashions, women with bustles and, and mm. so on. Um, but also these fabulous brick buildings. And they very, very often used these new imported aniline pigments um, that hadn't been used traditionally, um, which were these, these very vivid reds, intense purples and greens and yellows. And they were often known as the colors of progress. So just by using these colors themselves, it really symbolized the fact that Japan was modernizing and, and sort of emerging as a, a world power in its own right. Mm. So it's a very conscious use of these particular colors. Um, but if you think of Hiroshige or Hokusai, one of the, 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 the earlier, even the, the really only a, a few decades earlier. Yeah, it yeah. looks very different, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, at the bottom, we have the Japanese flag. Uh, I hope you're not going to ask me what all the other flags are, because I don't know. <laughs> no, I was just... Um, whether there was a reason why red had been chosen as the... And, you know, they talk about the land of the rising sun, but red presumably must be... must also be a highly significant colour in... Yes, it's always been a colour, I think, that's been associated with, um, you know, high rank and, um, yes. So, so yes, I think, I think you're right there. Um, and then if we look in detail, it's, it's tremendously, it's tremendously detailed, presumably underneath where the flaps are opened up. It's, it's, is it apart from the 10th, did you say the 10th floor, which was the, the cafe? Yes. Good. Are the rest of them all, because they're not all open in this particular picture that, that we can see, are they all shops? 
Most shops, yes. Um, so yes. Yeah, so as you, it, it is very carefully and meticulously depicted. So when you when you sort of first see the print, it's just this tall red brick building mm. with with all these I think it's 176 glass windows, which in itself is very modern and, and different. Yeah. I mean, Japan obviously has a long history of creating tall buildings. You have big stone castles and and pagodas in in, in temples, mm. but this sort of this is something very different. So yes, inside um, you have um, mostly shops and sort of fancy shops selling you know, often imported. Um, goods, but I think I would imagine it's a little bit like an airport mm, lounge, yeah. you know, um, with, with different goods. Um, some of which are labelled. I mean, there's a there's a rice cracker shop. There are <laughs> um, there's a, a jeweller selling precious stones. There's um, fabric in one area. So, that, so there's also a little exhibition space. Um, I think the first exhibition they had here was photographs of geisha. It was like a, like a beauty contest from photographs of, of geisha in, the, um, okay. in here. Wow. And then um, what's what's even more fun is that if you open the first layer of, of flaps, that you can you can just about you can see yeah. when you first open it. Underneath, there's another layer of flaps, and these open to reveal which is the thing that was the most exciting feature of this whole building was Japan's first ever electric elevator. So they had a lift in here, really? which was described as a, an ascending and descending room, and it caused huge excitement. Um, and um, it's a bit like two cable cars. Really? Um, and uh, to show, we didn't. We, it was quite hard to, dis to display this yeah. print, obviously, because you want to show what it looks like closed. You also yeah. want to show what it looks like open. And we've, we've opened some of the flaps. I was going to ask um, how, I mean, that's your curatorial decision, yes, which ones to open and yes. which one not to open. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we, 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 we didn't actually end up showing the, 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 the elevator, but then you, the, you can see these two um, kind of cable car lifts crammed with people yeah, yeah. who found it very exciting and magical. Although I have to say, it clearly, it was the first time this had happened in Japan, and it clearly um, was problematical because after six months it was closed down um, um, through you know, health and safety reasons. <laughs> we've been, uh, as a company, we've been working in Afghanistan and the, the first escalator in Kabul was a huge big deal. You could imagine people yes. had just never seen, yes. never seen anything like it, Gosh. and you know, lifts as well. And would this have been open to, just on the, the history of this building, would it have been open to anybody? Yes. Oh, it so was you... specifically built as a, a kind of a, a tourist attraction. Okay. Um, in Asakusa, which is an area where there's a, a, a big famous temple, um, but it was also a, a kind of a, an up-and-coming entertainment district. I mean, it actually had historically been a, um, an, an area with lots of, of different kinds of entertainments, and it continued to develop in, in that way. And then, presumably, even with those tall buildings that you just referenced, Nobody would have seen Tokyo from this height. No. It must and have been quite something. That was quite something, and we take it for granted, don't yeah, we, looking yeah. down on our, in our, on our surroundings. But no, at, at the time, it was something new and extremely exciting. So yeah. yes, it has a, a special viewing platform right at the very top. So yes, this would have been the first time that people actually looked down on, on Tokyo. You, you, from the top, you got a panoramic view of the whole of the city, and on a find it, you could even see Mount Fuji. Really? Yes. Was there ever a time when this, like subsequently happened to Paris, the, the Eiffel Tower became the symbol? Was there ever a time when this became the symbol yes, of Tokyo? Absolutely. For oh. a long time, it was it was very much the, the landmark of, of Tokyo. Um, and just going back to the artist, yes. do we read anything into the fact he's called himself the fourth? Were his, do we know anything about his parent, his father or his parents or his grandparents? Were they also artists? Was he from a tradition of art? Yes, so the Utagawa is the key, the key name there. So that's a, a family of woodblock print designers ah. um, who worked for, for, for generations. So you have Utagawa Kuniyoshi, Utagawa Kuri Sada, lots and lots of different Utagawa. So it just meant that these designers were working in that particular school and they studied with previous Utagawa masters. Um, so the Kuni um, Masa, he's taken the Kuni from the name of his ma master and, and he's added. So you get lots of different Kunis. Oh, okay. um, so you have Kuniyoshi, and then you have Kunisada, and you have Kunimasa, and you have various different artists. So they're, they're working in the, the same school, um, you know, working with, in the same styles, with the same subject matters. Claire, absolutely fascinating. I'm now going to look through your entire exhibition, which I'm afraid anyone listening to the podcast, you've only got until January the 3rd, 2022, to do that, or buy the catalogue, of course, which is great. And um, once again, Claire, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at 7th-art.com or contact us by emailing info at 7th-art.com. See you next time.